Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by A. Vanderwart. We're going to be speaking about preventing myopia before it starts. Optometric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Well, thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Uh, so excited to have uh, my good friend Eif Vanderwerk here from, from the Netherlands. And uh, as many of you probably know, uh, Eif has, uh, has been a really, really impactful person in the space of myopia management over the years. Uh, Eif is a, uh, a, by and large, a researcher and an educator. Uh, he spends time in the clinic from time to time, but really... He's somebody who takes these uh, really complex topics. And what I love about what Afe does is he boils them down so that we can apply them in our consulting room. So Afe, we're so proud to have you on the Myopia podcast. Thank you for being here, my friend. Oh, the pleasure is mine, Afe. The pleasure is mine. Um, well, as you, if you're watching, uh, you can see me, me from my rooftop uh, in, uh, in the middle of, uh, of Amsterdam. So right to you. Uh, <laughs> on the on the west coast of uh, the US. How cool is this, uh, Dave? It is. It is. It's very cool. So, if the uh, the the people who are listening, most everybody knows you, but if they don't, kind of share a little bit about uh, what you do and uh, how you're helping our industry and in the things that are you're passionate about and involved with. Yeah. So um, I'm actually not doing that much research into myopia directly, uh, Dave. But as you say, what I do is I try to um, educate my students, but I get practitioners around the world on specialty contact lens topics. And so scleral lenses is a biggie uh, for me, has been in the last 10 years for sure. Um, um, let me look ahead. Uh, the next 10 years will be uh, specialty soft lenses, I think. We talked about that actually in another episode uh, of yours yeah. uh, for, for the Optomatic Insight. Um, and, um, well, ortho K and rigid lenses in general uh, has always had my passion. Uh, and in the Netherlands, my, my little country here in, uh, in Western Europe, Ortho K is extremely popular. I would guess uh, uh, one of the, the highest percentages of Ortho K maybe in the world, not to brag, but it's just, we, we have such a history of corneal lenses and corneal topography, and then Ortho K uh, hit off uh, early 2000 or something, and um, boom, it just it went straight from corneal GPs to, to Ortho K, and in the end, it's not that different, actually. Uh, it's just you're trying to do a different thing. So myopia actually brings it all together. Uh, Dave is an optometrist. Um, and one of the other episodes we talked about, I was one of the first few ap uh, optometrists in the Netherlands. And of course, um, optometry ties in with this whole myopia thing as well. Uh, it's, it's retinal health, it's corneal health. Um, and then it's, um, it's all these specialty lens uh, uh, topics that we can talk about. So it always excites me. Having said that, I am not the expert, but let, let's try to boil it down because I follow a lot. I will read, try to read everything. And recently at the uh, Global Specialty Lens Symposium, which I'm on the committee to, um, we had a, a nice session actually, uh, which I, I happened to chair on the ABC of myopia. And mm -hmm. uh, it, the, the, the subtitle was from atropine to Zernica aberration. So it covered all the, all the different treatments, including atropine, and then all the way to higher order aberrations, which are Zernica polynomials. Uh, Zernica, um, it's a term that a lot of people know probably in the optics field. I just want to throw it in, Dave. He's Dutch, actually, or he was Dutch, obviously. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 just, just, just a side mark. Out there. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know that, but he lives, uh, he, he lived, well, 10 minutes walk from here. Uh, I, I looked oh. it up. Uh, actually, during COVID times, I had time to, uh, to do that. I wrote a little uh, column about that. Well, but so that, in a nutshell, is what I have yeah. with, uh, with myopia. You, you mentioned that you're not an expert in this. And, you know, I think that the reality is that the more we learn about a topic, 
the more we realize we have a lot more to learn. And so some of the top experts in the country don't believe they are because they know how much they still have to learn to know more about it. So I think that your, your passion around myopia management has driven you to really know a lot so that you can educate a lot of this. And, you know, one, one of the things that you've written and, uh, and tell us a little bit about your, uh, your newsletters, but one of the things that you wrote about recently was the effect of COVID on myopia. And I think that we're starting to, to touch on that in our practices. I'm, I'm starting to see people come back in and we're starting to see people who maybe developed myopia during COVID, but tell us a little bit about number one, your newsletters, and then tell us a little bit about COVID's effect on myopia. Yeah, and, and it's, it's funny you say that, Jed, because I hear more reports like that day from my care practitioners yeah, around the world, really, that they got a feeling that uh, myopia has been progressing faster or they see more, but it, it's hard to pin down, right? That's always the issue. Is it just an N01 or is it really something going on? And then all of a sudden, uh, this, uh, this study from China popped up um, just a couple of months ago. And um, it looked at the confinement period, the COVID period in China during, I think, the first, yeah, I think it was the best part of that year. And um, you know what? In six, seven, and eight-year-olds, indeed, there was an increase in myopia compared to uh, other years, I think, they control, they compared it to. So uh, they concluded that there is uh, such an effect. So we knew that, of course, if you stay more indoors, uh, less outdoor, um, then, um, yeah, myopia may increase. And that's exactly what we've been, been seeing. So... Yeah, it shouldn't surprise us, but but again, it's usually hard to pin down. And this one was published in a in a peer reviewed journal, high ranked. So uh, I guess we have to uh, believe it. And I, I got two uh, teams in the house, so of course they they were homeschooling and everything. Uh, we didn't see them for days. They were they were locked up in their uh, in their rooms. Oh, uh, I got one funny remark, uh, Dave. So. Um, we were, I was talking about the effect of myopia on, on eyes uh, to my kids, and I was talking about retinal detachment and the risk. That's obviously where it all comes down to. And I don't know if you know that. Well, your wife is Dutch, or maybe you do, but the Dutch word for uh, retina is uh, netvlies. Netvlies. So I was talking about netvlies this and netvlies that and uh, detachment of the netvlies in the uh, and, and then at some point, um, my daughter tried to summarize things. And she said, well, that Netflix uh, detachment. Uh, <laughs> and I thought, that's it. That's such a beautiful term. We were watching too much Netflix. Your, your, ret- your retina is going to detach. So I use that in my columns, uh, actually. But uh, yeah, I call them my, uh, my current themes that we have in the house. And um, well, fingers crossed, they're not myopic yet, which is a surprise with two myopic parents. But uh, in general, um, to answer your questions, uh, we have to educate, uh, Dave, and I think that's a good start of this discussion. Myopia control is not selling a product. It's, it's about communication. It's about building relationship with the kid and the parents and talking about what is going on. And it starts with less indoor, less near tasks, more outdoor, that kind of stuff. And then at some point, maybe down the line, we may have solutions in, in, in form and shapes of products. But it's the other way around. It doesn't, and that's, ah, let me play advocate of the devil a little bit. But um, I think some people in our industry, let's put this mildly, uh, are focusing just a little bit too much on the product rather than the myopia management per se. What do you what do you mean by that? What are you observing that you're saying we're focusing on the products and less on the myopia management? Is that that we need to be talking more with the patients as opposed to peddling the products? Or that, what, what that, do you feel that that means? Exactly that, uh, Dave. So um, it, it just depends. It's, it's almost like in what country you were born and that's how you grow up and that's what you believe, right? And, and that's your world. So I know people at uh, the, the university hospital here, uh, ophthalmology, and all they live and breathe is, is atropine. And there's nothing wrong with atropine, but the optical solutions are sort of on the sideline. 
Um, if you look at some of the contact lens um, 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 well, meetings uh, that we go to, all we hear is contact lenses, contact lenses, contact lenses. Well, myopia management is not about contact lenses. It's, it's about much more. Uh, and then now the glasses are entering the market and you go to optical conventions and, and what have you. And, and all they talk is, is glasses and from that angle. But again, it's totally upside down. You got to start with the kit and the myop kit and maybe even before he gets myopic. There's beautiful growth charts. Uh, I'm sure you've seen them. The, the, the Tiedemann, actually Tiedemann is Dutch too. Just wanted to throw that in. Uh, but you, now everybody's using the Tiedemann graphs, even the Brian Holden and uh, some of the instruments, the Myopia Master and the, uh, the other one they're using. Uh, everybody's using the Tiedemann growth charts. Like if you go to the pediatrician, right? Um, you put a dot based ideally on the actual length. Maybe we to talk about that now or some other time as well and then you can see where the kid is and you know if you follow that you can you can see where the kid is going and then you'll start thinking all right how much outdoor time is there with this kid uh, can we increase that is he uh, susceptible to that um, or not and then if if it doesn't work if you see that grow that, that compared to the growth chart the line going up well, then you may have to start thinking about interventions. And then there's this whole arsenal of interventions that we have. So that would be my, my, my route to take and not say, mm -hmm. well, we got a product. Let's see if we can, uh, we can sell that, basically. So, you know, what I'm hearing from you is that it, it may behoove us to start thinking about the, the problem of myopia and its root causes that are causing the progression for patients rather yeah. than just jumping to and saying, well, you've got this problem. Let's throw the solutions at you while we're ignoring what the root causes are for the patients. Exactly. So let's talk a little bit about that just as a reminder for everybody. You know, uh, you mentioned briefly the, the time indoors, the, you know, close proximity. Talk a little bit about what what we're seeing or what we're knowing to be some of these some of these root causes of myopia mm. and how you know we might be able to talk with our patients and parents about that. Right. So the um the um everybody or a lot of people may be familiar with the 202020 rule in dry eyes, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the people here at um, the Erasmus University in Rotterdam, they adapted that uh, to the 2022 rule. And um, if you're not familiar with that, it's about 20 minutes uh, outdoor. Um, uh, let me see if I say that right. <laughs> it's two hours outdoor. That's the two. And uh, after 20 minutes of reading, at least take a 20 second break. So that's the 2020 uh, tool. So it's, 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 uh, well, I, I wouldn't say it's a joke. It's 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 serious, but it's it's. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how scientific that is, but it's a good rule. It's a good starting point to say, well, listen, two hours a day outdoor, and that includes biking to school and everything and sports. But you need that, and then um, not too much reading time um, in one go. So take breaks, and also the distance is important. So don't keep it too close. I'm sure you've seen kids at airports or restaurants, very young kids holding iPhones or uh, iPads very close to their eyes. Um, the, the TV, for instance, is less of an issue and even a computer screen for sure is less of an issue than holding something at, uh, well, I, I'm in centimeters here, but 20 or 30 centimeters, but, but very close by. Uh, so that, those are the important things. And uh, people are blaming the cell phone or the digital devices. Well, yes and no. Um, it, it's not the digital part of the digital device. It's that we're holding it so close and that we're holding it long so close. I mean, my kids love reading, but after 20 minutes of reading, typically you take a little bit of a break, right? But Netflix, you can watch for an hour at, at 20 centimeter, for instance, or something like that. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but uh, so yes, it's a digital device, but it's not, I think, the digital part of that device. It's not electronics per se, it's, it's near work. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, we, we, we also know that there is an aspect and we think about this in the dry eye space, so to speak, is that with digital devices, we don't blink as often. And that could become a problem with, with the digital aspect, but in the myopia aspect, it's the distance and it's the prolonged periods that we're doing certain activities. I think we can look to several studies that date way back of where, uh, where you know, we introduce, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the Western society of, of television and reading and all that certain to, to certain subgroups of people. And we see progression of myopia, or I think there's, there's a great study on individuals who spend a lot of time in a submarine, like uh, it was certain military. And those people became more myopic because the fact that they couldn't relax and they couldn't look further away. So those studies are out there with regards to that. Well, what about what about the outdoor time, this two hours that uh, you mentioned? Uh, why, why are we thinking two hours outdoors? Is it, is it just looking far away? Could somebody get as much benefit from just being in a gymnasium and looking far away for two hours? Like I said, I'm not the expert here, but what I read and what I hear, it's, it's certainly giving your eyes a break, so looking in distance. Mm -hmm. And there is something with outdoor light. Uh, we can't yeah. really pin it down, but there is something with outdoor light. It, is, it may have to do with the dopamine production on the retinal level. But again, that's getting, for me, already too technical almost. But um, it's got to do something with that. So there are experiments now with, with being, if you do uh, classrooms that are completely made of glass, would that have a positive effect? They're, they're trying that in, in China, um, things like that. But that's mm -hmm. outdoor light, but you're still indoors. So what it, it may, may be coming down back to optics, which is really our thing. And that's why I love myopia so much. Higher order operations play, play such an important role. But even the wavelength of light the, yeah. that's, our, that's our thing, right? Um, the wavelength of the exact light, the violet light to be exact, may play a, an important role. But um, I, I'm getting off my track here, uh, Dave, because again, I'm not the expert, but it may be a certain wavelength that may be good for the eye and may tell the retina basically to not grow backwards or uh, just stay where it is because it's 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 quite amazing right we all start as high probes and then some well as soon as we approach the age of six we're we're, we're well we're still a little bit of high probe but then after six we, we certainly enter the amotropic age and then something happens or not we stay there which is the normal optical um um well back information thing that tells the retina to stay where it is and oftentimes even in my up you see it does stay there the retina stays there and then all of a sudden boom it starts to grow in a backward direction so that is a crucial time but that's at early age so and i think at early age we can already tell if a kid is not hyperopic we could probably tell it will be myopic later in life yeah, well, that's, absolutely. That's where you can start, and that's where you can start talking to, to uh, well, to kids, but obviously to parents or, or caregivers about uh, about this whole thing, telling mm -hmm. that whole story. Yeah, you know, I think a holistic approach. There's the the study that we we kind of get this two hours from. I think that's a study um, out of Australia that really showed that it, that kids who spent two hours outside. Uh, did not develop myopia as earlier. And there's other studies that look at, you know, the spectrum of the seasons and different parts of the world. Seasons mean different things, but more myopia happens in the winter seasons. And is it because uh, of the wavelengths of light? Is it the fact that we're not spending as much time outside? What may it be? But, you know, oftentimes uh, those of us who live in rainy climates uh, we don't go outside at all during the winter time, right? Um, and uh, and it's so critical for us to really advocate for getting outside, uh, not just for the relaxation, but as you point out, uh, may, maybe it's the dopamine, maybe it's the vitamin D. We're not really sure, but the studies are are already pointing us that the direction of two hours is so critical. So I, I completely agree with you, and I think. 
it's it's more than just anecdotal evidence that we think this right we've got the studies right. to back it up we just need to now implement it yeah you know? correct absolutely and uh, I, I we just don't know everything about it it's uh, yeah. it's it's a, and and for me it's it's a bit of a confusing modality to be honest uh, uh dave at one end we're hearing so much, including from the companies, uh, about myopia. But there's courses about it. Um, the BCLA started the myopia program. Um, BCLA is the British Contact Lens Society, etc., uh, etc. Et so there's especially myopia clinics. So um, that spurs the enthusiasm, I guess, for eye care practitioners. But on the other hand, there's so much we don't know, and um, there's this well, famous paper by uh, Noel Brennan and, and others, common health beliefs about myopia that lack robust, uh, robust evidence based. So he's, he really looks at every piece of evidence we think we have, and then he's, he's, there's some myths there that he's, uh, he's, he's, he's debunking, I think. Um, so yeah, we, for one thing, we don't know the exact mechanism behind the, the myopia management effect. So if we talk about contact lenses and glasses, we know probably the peripheral retina has something to do with it, but we don't know exactly what it is. And same with atropine. We don't know what the exact mechanism is that, that causes uh, myopia to slow down, which is a bit weird, I guess. But mm -hmm. at the same time, it does work. So let's stick mm -hmm. to the facts. And it's the same with outdoor. There's so many questions there. But in the end of the day, uh, Dave, um, I got two kids. You know, they got to go outside because I know it works. And there's, uh, there's this beautiful book. Um, it's a few years ago, and he also has a TED talk. And I'm trying to, from the top of my head, to say his name right because he's a good friend of mine, Nick Despositas, I think is his name. But it's Nick Despositas. Yeah, that's him. Thank you, um, Doctor D. We uh, we typically call him uh, and his patients too. But um, he's written this book and and this TED talk about. Well, you call it holistic um, approach. I think that's what he does. It's it's much more than just one or two or three it's a combination of things it certainly has to do with 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 pressure also and with stress that that that, that parents put on kids and that's all that is not scientific but uh nick has uh, what 20 25 years of um of myopia management behind his belt so he certainly know uh, knows what he's talking about so we should look up that ted talk and put maybe a link uh, yeah that people and look it up yeah yeah we'll uh and maybe he's a good one for this uh, podcast actually no absolutely yeah we do we, we we do hope that we can get dr d to uh come and talk with us well you know i think to kind of summarize here uh what i really took away and uh and i'm guilty of this right i get in the in, in the in the consultation room with my patients and they've got myopia and the parent wants to slow it down okay well let's introduce the product that we need to do that Right. And we may be forgetting about that other half of the conversation that is so critical. So I appreciate you bringing that up, reminding us of all of that is we need to be focusing on the cause, not just the solution so that we can reduce the progression, both with the lenses or the solution or the glasses uh, or the, uh, the eye drop, um, but also reduce the root cause and help our help our patients in that way. So. Uh, thank you for your perspectives on that. Yeah, and, and I mean, preventive medicine is is is, is taking off worldwide. I'm sure, um, and it, I think this is part of it. When you talk about sugar in in, in drink and and uh, you know diabetes and everything, this is part of that. We we got to start looking at how can we prevent this uh, epidemic, uh, like like some are calling it, and. Um, the, the, the tricky part is, and, and again, this makes it such a confusing uh, modality. Um, you're really take, talking about a myopia mortgage almost, right? I mean, we're talking about trying to reduce myopia now, and, but we don't see the problems until 40 years from now in, in, those, in those same kids. If you're 10 years, you're probably not until my age mm -hmm. that you start seeing uh, the problem. So um, it's hard to talk about it and say, well, listen, in 50 years, you may have a problem. Why don't we do this or that? Or why don't you go more outdoor? They're like, duh. Um, 
<laughs> so uh, it's 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 not an easy modality, but I'm looking at at you know the if we have to believe the research and, and let's do that, why not? I mean, we have no other choice, but uh, the chances of um, retinopathy uh, is reducing significantly, uh, apparently, with every diopter increase, no matter at what level. So uh, the other thing is that some eye care practitioners think, all right, I'll start worrying if the kid is minus six. Well, obviously, that's too late. You got to prevent them from, from being minus six. But even, again, if I have to listen to the experts who know what they're talking about, an increase from minus two to minus four, every diopter, no matter at well, what level, has that increase in, in risk at the end of the, well, not the end of the day, but the end of the life, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we got to no, talk it, about it now, and it is uh, something that uh, is a worry in the long run. And if you have a parent with, with minus 10 who had retinal problems themselves, you don't have to explain things, right? Then it's easy, right. and they're already coming themselves. But it's the other ones uh, where that's not the case that we have to uh, start talking about it. So let's, yeah, I like that. Let's do that. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you joining us for this episode of the Myopia podcast. Uh, Aoife, it's uh, always a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, and please stay tuned uh, for future episodes where we're going to uh, talk more in depth with, uh, with Aoife and with others about lenses and solutions, uh, multifocal orthokeratology, axial length. Uh, we've got other exciting topics coming up. Uh, please like and subscribe and uh, we'll see you on the next show. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.